Firstly, congratulations for the end of the semester and an awesome job on the presentation. Since the microsites group is already up there and ready to go, why don't we have you guys come up and talk about it first? Okay, um, I'm going to be presenting on our microsite project. Um, I think you'll see from our process that our vision of what the microsite would be really evolved over the process um, of the course, but I think we came to an end result that is in line with what digital democracy is looking for. So it will be very interesting to get their feedback on that. So we're going to start off talking about what our project objectives were. Um, and these objectives uh, kind of became our final objectives after you know we learned a lot from them. They weren't necessarily our initial objectives. But as we learned more about digital democracy, this came into focus. So the first thing is to promote digital democracy as a remote access project. Um, for those of you who I think everybody knows uh, based on working on the projects, but remote access is a digital cool toolkit that allows indigenous communities to collect data about um, human rights or environmental um, violations that may be occurring in their territory. And DD is currently doing a pilot project in Peru. Um, and as such, um, what digital democracy really wants to do with remote access is ultimately to give activists and other organizations the tools to replicate remote access for other issue areas. So one of the things that um, we really wanted to make sure of was that we wanted to mention Peru because we think that project is very compelling, but we didn't want to um, make the site about that because this really needs to be a broader kind of um, situation. So um, in order to figure out what we were going to do, we sort of had a, a pretty clear process. Uh, in pre-design, we researched three key areas. The first was we wanted to find a platform where we could develop our website. And we chose Wix because it was easy to use and had very flexible templates. Um, we also wanted to review other nonprofit websites and get some ideas on microsite best practices. And finally, we wanted to understand digital democracy um, and their objectives, which we came to understand through a meeting with them and talking with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, going forward. Um, this is an illustration of some of the best practices that we found in nonprofit web design. Um, here are some of the sites. These were award-winning sites. And what we thought was really compelling about these was, one, they created an emotional connection. Um, two, they're not very cluttered, you know, just a few tabs. Brand recognition was key. Um, there was a logo from the organization that was um, uh, very visible. Um, that they had a consistent visual theme and also that they could create some sort of a video presence. Now, these are best practices. We weren't necessarily able to ultimately accomplish um, all of these things, uh, partly because digital democracy didn't think they could sustain it. Um, but Aaron will speak more to that. Um, we also, microsites are obviously, can be a bit different than the larger website. So we also found best practices here. This was to have a front page that is both simple and graphic, to provide opportunities to interact up front, to include a link to the original brand, um, to embed a donation form rather than linking to the main website, um, to frame things in terms of problem solution, and to tell stories. And again, we'll talk about this a little more. These were what we identified as best practices based on digital democracy's objectives and, um, and what they were able to ultimately sustain. We couldn't do all of these things, but we did keep this in mind as we designed the site. Um, and then finally, understanding the digital democracy project, um, when we reviewed their materials, we completely fell in love with the stories that they, that they had about you know, all the people that were using this technology um, it was just kind of heartbreaking, like a lot of the things that were that were going on, um, you know, environmentally and that sort of a thing. So basically, um, we we really thought, okay, well, our original vision was that we want to do a site centered around a map, and then we would place people on the map and have their stories um, get you interested um, in their cause. But when we met with Digital Democracy, everything changed because we found that what they wanted was a remote access focused site, which would be sort of modeled after this local data site, which you can um, see a picture of here. 
Um, they didn't want it to focus on issues driving the remote access project. They wanted the site to resemble this local, local data project, which was a similar US-based initiative. And they also wanted the audience to be activists and other organizations, um, not just volunteers um, and donors. So that's, I'm gonna at this point um, pass things over to Erin. She's gonna take over the presentation and tell you um, where we went next after we got this news. Okay. Able to walk as well. Let's see. Oh, I look to everyone now. Am I? Is my back to everyone still? <laughs> yeah. Just take turn. Either press the right arrow all the way or the left arrow. Yeah. There you go. There you go. And then you can use the camera right. control button to kind of look at the um, slide viewer again. It's the camera control oh, button. So it's the just bottom. the eye. It's the it's the one on the left that looks like a ball. And you just hit the left arrow, right arrow on the ball looking one, which is the orbit camera. And it should be on the, not the eye, the second one. That looks like an eye with arrows around Oh, it. this, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if that's okay for everyone, then I can see, I can see the slides okay. Okay, that looks um, good. Okay. So, um, so like Amy mentioned, when we were first um, designing our microsite, we fell in love with the stories as she already said um and we also had planned on focusing focusing more on the individuals who were working in peru and um more of the detailed problems and projects in peru um but after we spoke with um with emily from digital democracy we realized that they wanted a site that was more that was speaking more to remote access than giving um, information so that activists who were working in other places in the world and on different issues would find their resource um, and be able to employ the technology that they're using in, in a different country and a different um, issue entirely. Um, so uh, Emily mentioned localdata.com a lot while we were talking to her, both on Google Hangout and in person. So we took the hint, and so we went onto the the site a lot and got a lot of our microsite from it. Um, local data does something very similar to remote access, but they focus on the U.S., um, which is basically. Um, linking technology um, issues to uh, activists in different um, locations. So for remote access, that means um, different cities and then for local data, well, yeah, different cities as well, but uh, they're US based versus um, international based. So um, we focused on this site a lot. This was definitely our inspiration. And um, oh, and another um, big part that we changed was um, Emily told us that the audience was really activists and other organizations, including mostly tech savvy people who were going to be in areas where they would be helping people who are not tech savvy. So that was really the audience when um, originally we were going to focus more on issues of fundraising or awareness um, of Peru and the pollution. So that we definitely switched gears a lot after talking with her. Um, so we had originally, as Amy mentioned, we originally wanted to do a map and have some interactive um, videos and information on some of the real people that were working on the ground there. Um, but because remote access is fairly new, um, some of these resources were not quite available. So we we decided not to include this on the site and to instead make it more of a simple microsite, which is what um, Emily asked us to do. So based 
based on the aesthetics of the local data site, um, we we went back to Wix and we changed our template. We had um, actually used a different template first, and then um, based on the feedback of Emily, we went with something that was even more streamlined and simple than what we had originally chosen. Um, and I'll go to the next. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to, I wonder if we can focus here. We, we still, um, we, we wanted to use some of the graphics. I don't know if you can see on the left screen very well, um, but because we liked the, the graphics and the, the people in the stories so much, we did try to use um, as much of the graphics and the photographs that were available to us from Emily. So on the site itself, we, we used some of the images that she had given to us to kind of keep some of the, um, the, the personality and the emotion of what they're doing, um, you know, uh, prevalent on the site. So how does our site um, measure up to the best practices for microsites that are linked to major home pages and major websites? Um, the, the microsite is very simple, so uh, which was one of the criteria, criteria for uh, building a microsite. Um, we wanted to provide opportunities for people who are visiting the page to be interactive, and that's something that we didn't do, and that was mostly because, um, one, they weren't ready for people to interact too much with the website because they don't have a person who is dedicated to um, uploading more images, answering people's questions, things of that nature, so it wouldn't have, in essence, been interactive. So she didn't want, Emily didn't want to, um, commit themselves to something that they weren't ready to do. So we didn't add that feature in the website, in the microsite. Um, we did have a link, we do have a link back to the um, original brand and the original home page. We have the Digital Democracy uh, official logo on the upper right left, I'm sorry, upper left corner of the screen, which you can see on the, the left movie screen. Um, we we did frame things in, in terms of problem and solution. So like I said, originally we were planning on doing the problem as the oil contamination and what they were doing to solve the problem. So we still have the problem solution um, framework, but we changed it so that the problem is now more of a lack of technology in areas of the world, uh, particularly Peru, since that's the pilot. and how remote access and digital democracy are solving that issue and how activists can also solve that issue using remote access as resources. Um, did we tell stories? Yes, we do have, I, I think, some stories on there. Um, there there are uh, some features of some of the people who are volunteering who are all local um, people who are just from the area and are passionate about um, having justice in that area as far as the um, oil companies and, and the environment are concerned. Um, and we also have the team page, which highlights some um, Emily and Gregor and, and uh, their drive for starting the organization. Um, so currently, when you go on to Digital Democracy's website, they didn't have a microsite or a web page that was devoted to remote access. So we thought that this would be great for them, considering their resources are really going into remote access and spreading the resources of remote access. This is especially true since they just got a $200,000 grant from um, from the Knight Foundation. So we think that this is going to be great as far as exposure goes. Um, right now, if you if a person wanted to get more information on remote access, there's really more information on the Knight Foundation website rather than on digital democracy. So we think that this is going to be a great resource for them. So what 
does digital democracy need to do to keep this sustainable? Um, we think that it should definitely be interactive, especially since um, the technology issues are going to be different in each country. And also because um, if they want to appeal to different issues that are going on, particularly human rights and environmental issues, there's it, there's such complex issues that it would be great and I think very powerful to have an interactive um, component to their site and ways that people can get involved if they are just stumbling on the page and didn't know about the, the issue or the problem in the first place. Um, it would also be great to have more personal information, um, more photos, more videos, which I know that they're currently collecting. Um, again, just so that if, if people are not aware of an issue and and happen to stumble upon it um, they can they can learn more about the issue without having to go somewhere else I think it's important to keep people on the site as much as possible so that by the end of their their web visit they'll want to help they'll want to become an activist they'll they're already an activist and now they realize that um, remote access is a great tool for them and I think that personal stories and um, more interactive uh, videos information would be great for that. <clears throat> so um, there currently there is no um, there's no interaction for for donors and um, fundraising. Um, you know, I'm not sure if they if they want fundraising there for now. So that would be something that Emily and Gregor would, um, you know, could could decide and change at the at that point. But I know currently that wasn't something that they were focused on. And um, the site is now live, actually. So we could go on there if unless everyone can see these. Um, do you think I could switch, Josephine, and just put the um Yeah, the web yeah. Page up? I mean the web page is actually already up on, on, on this other screen on the left side. Oh it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So okay. Just, oh, all right. I'm going back yeah. over to my screen. Okay, so Oh yeah, I put, all right. I put I was the screenshots in there just in case, but you know, it's it's it looks like it's it's up all right. Okay, so um, so this is our. I'm trying to. I can't really see that, but I'll try to go by memory. Um, so the this is our about our our home page. Um, and it kind of focuses on what remote access is. And Erin, if you just want to tell me where to go, I can navigate for you. If you can't see it. Oh, oh, okay. I can see it now. I don't know where my okay. body is now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Hopefully I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so this is the home page, and um, it really just it it gives information on what remote access is, um, which is a you can read it here. It says a mobile reporting platform for remote and reporting platform for remote and indigenous communities. Um, so what they do is if there if there's an an area of the world where there's a human rights or an environmental atrocity and they don't have any technology um, to get the information or the images out to a, a larger population, perhaps in a city or an international population, um, remote access trains people to collect data, to transmit data, um, and a lot of other things that are more specialized depending on the area that they're in and what their specific problems are. Um, okay, how do I move it to the next one now? You can click that more. If you hover your mouse over that more button at the top, you'll oh, see more. The, uh, mm -hmm, the menu. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Um, okay. Okay, so see, um, so I already kind of um, summarized a few times what they're what they're doing, um, and then this is an example of how we tried to make it as personal as possible. These are all images that were taken by Gregor and Emily when they went to um, visit. So we uploaded a lot of these um, images so that it would make more of an impact on people. 
And then since they are um, piloting this remote access technology program in Peru, we thought that it was important to put information about Peru in there, which you can see at the bottom here, um, which is, as everyone knows from, from reading the documents, um, they're suffering from uh, health and environmental impacts of widespread um, oil pollution. And I'll go back up here. Um, Aaron, what what uh, page are, are you on right now? I think I feel like I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Oh, okay. Well, I just switched to the FAQ. Am I okay? Am All I right. not doing? Okay. Because I'm still seeing the yeah, I'm still seeing the home page. Okay. Oh. There you go. I just I just switched it to the about page, which is what she was talking about in terms of those images and stuff. Oh, all right, all right, okay. So here's the images she was talking about. Oh, okay, perfect. And then, so Amy, can you switch it to the FAQ page? I'm going to try. Okay, I'm on the the left okay. screen. Is, okay. Now it is yeah. On the FAQ okay, area. great. Thank you. Um. Okay, so um. We chose this FAQ page for two reasons. One is because there is an FAQ page on the local data site. And as I've already mentioned a couple of times, um, Emily really liked that page. So we wanted to, it to look similar. Um, and then also since remote access is really not featured on Digital Democracy's website, um, if people had questions we wanted we wanted there to be an FAQ page so that people could maybe learn more and get a couple of simple questions answered and as you can see these are really tailored for an audience of activists and um, hopefully they would have more um, questions and answers that they would add on here but we thought of a few that um, you know would be simple and more more general for activists and then the last page is the team page We, um, we took this actually from the digital democracy page. I mean, we, we reworked it, but we wanted it to be consistent with the digital democracy page and in case someone um, found their way onto the remote access site instead of onto the main digital democracy site. So again, this is just a way for um, remote access and digital democracy to be co-branded and to be consistent with one another. Um, okay, so let me see if I can go back to the right screen. Oh no, I don't know how to move back now. Uh, Aaron, can I help you with anything? Yeah, well, I, don't, I just don't know how to move back. <laughs> um, okay, how can I, I have no control over my body uh, now, did let's you, see. Did you want to move to the, the, the <laughs> web page that you were at before, or you actually want to move your body back? <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I think I, I, I went, sorry, this is like so anticlimactic now. So, um, but okay. you just moved. <laughs> I know now I, okay, um, just so now I don't know where I am. Oh yeah. Hit okay, here we go. Anytime you sort of get lost of where you are, you can always hit escape a couple of times and it will kind of like default back to your view. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so but this is a microsite that we that we designed for Digital Mo Democracy's remote access program. Congratulations to you guys. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Let's see. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. So why don't you guys um, just take a couple of questions if anybody has any questions for you. Does anyone have questions? All right, so I'll ask a couple just to get started. And um, firstly, congratulations. This is this is great. I think that you know, given the fact that um, you know it was a limited amount of time, and can everyone hear me all right? I feel like I'm it's like the network is skipping a little yep. bit. Okay. Yep. Um, given the limited amount of time, um, really, I think that we were just looking at like, well, okay, um, if you guys are able to wireframe something, that's great. But you not only wireframed it, you went ahead and you created the site too. So like, that's like really going sort of like way above and beyond sort of like what I feel like 
um, you had to do, especially since the class is only like nine weeks long and, uh, you know, six of the weeks are really just, um, only six of them are really like kind of working weeks. So I was going to ask the same thing that Cody is asking now in the text. Um, what was the hardest part of building the microsite? Or like, what were the kind of the biggest challenges? I and Erin jump in at any time, but I thought the biggest challenge was just figuring out what I, I felt like we we struggled to figure out what their goals were, and once we had that, it kind of all fell into into place. And they actually gave us a lot of good direction. But I think one of the challenges was at first we were kind of working a little bit in a vacuum, and that led us to go down a direction that we were all excited about. But then, like if you think of digital as our client, you know, it wasn't really serving our client's needs. So I think the regrouping was the most challenging. Yeah, I agree. Um, we weren't sure what the audience, you know, what they wanted the audience to be and what the goals were. So the most um, difficult part was just kind of coming at it from all angles at first when we were in the planning stage and um, it was really helpful for us to meet with Emily because we realized that she really had a focus of what she wanted both aesthetically and content wise and um, we were relieved and excited that um, she was so specific and that we could um, give her something that she wanted. Yeah, I was going to say like I you know, in the earlier sessions where we had Emily and the Google Hangout and just kind of talking back and forth, um, I think that probably what was happening was that they were trying to figure out what they needed the microsite to be as well. You know, it's like simply because I think the tool is just so new and they're still sort of leveraging how they want to present it and how they want to, you know, use it within the communities that I think that maybe what happened was that you knocked up against kind of like just the newness of it all. You know, which is basically a part of, of, of any kind of design process is like sometimes a client doesn't actually know what they want right at the beginning. And then as you start working with it, they, it starts to be more specific, you know, and there, there starts to be like some changes around it. But definitely, I feel like even for her talking through things like that probably helped focus it more. So, you know, um, kudos to you guys for just really being able to like adapt it and just like, you know, run with, you know, what, whatever what was uh, was being, you know brainstormed in the moment it was great um amy mary and i were all very flexible because like i said we already had another wix template that we had been working on and without hesitation all of us once we we met with her decided okay let's just kind of scratch what we have and let's give her exactly what she wants um, and so we started with a new template and it it was great good good and then um, I had another question about um, this, the best practices and sustainability. I like what you guys did with like looking at the award-winning sites and kind of um, sussing out really what were the best practices for each of them and trying to hit each one of them, which again, I know is really challenging because you're working with some relatively limited resources. Like I think they have great um, uh, photos and things like that. Um, but again, because of, it's just like, such a new platform and initiative, like it's, it's, it's really limited at the time. Um, so for the interactivity part, um, you talked about how in the future, like maybe when they have like more of the Knight Foundation grants in place and, you know, the, the resources to be able to go forward with that, that you would want more interactivity on the home page. Um, so what are you envisioning that interactivity to be specifically? Like more sort of, in, yeah, go ahead. Well. It, it wouldn't necessarily be on the home page, but what, what we originally suggested to them was that there could actually be a video module that could be like a how to develop um, remote access for your cause or something like that. Like basically to show an organization or an activist, like how do you put these toolkits together? You know, like it, you'll see on our front page that all their partners and stuff are listed there. Their partners, I, as I, we understand it, provide different components of the technology, but I think there's like a big job to be done for any activist organization wanting to use the toolkit to do coordination and then based on where your um, actual remote access project is, I mean, maybe some of those partners wouldn't be available and those kinds of things. But digital democracy is really, I mean, that's what they're doing. They're learning that, they're figuring that out. So like, you know, a step-by-step -step thing where you could actually like um, 
first of all, like, it's not completely interactive, but that there would be a video. Then that you could also, like, pose and ask questions to um, either partners or to digital democracy um, themselves that you could maybe test out a, a remote access, um, you know, project and kind of see how it works. Like, put yourselves in the shoes of someone who is actually doing this as a monitor or something like that. Those were some of the ideas that we that we threw out. But when we initially talked with them, we just threw out the idea of a video, which isn't even really interactive. It's just more media, um, just more media. And they said that they just really weren't at a point where they could develop something like that. So we didn't dig that much deeper. OK. Um, yeah, I can see where you're going with that, like once it's a platform that starts to be used and, you know, gains a little bit more critical mass, like probably what they'll want to do is put like some sort of like example case study or like a set of case studies up there where people can see like how it's being used and um, maybe some guidelines around it and things like that. Um, and I feel like maybe like a video like you're talking about could be part of that. Is that kind of the idea that you're going for? Yeah, and I would say that. Yeah. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say um, Emily and Gregor, their vision for remote access is, is to develop. Um, open source technology that activists could you can use. So by nature, it's going to be interactive. Um, and so we we had thought of of ways that the activists could communicate with each other and uh, on this site. Um, but like Amy already said, they just weren't at that point yet. But um, I think that it will be inevitable that the site will be interactive only because if nothing else, the remote access in and of itself will be interactive and constantly changing once they have uh, an international group of activists and programmers that are working on this technology. Right, right. Okay, great, you guys. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to the next presentation? Alrighty. So let's have a look at the screen here and get the digital strategy group presentation slides in place. I think it's just the next one over here. Yep. Alrighty. Okay. Okay. So Katie, you gonna start us off here? Yes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we kind of came to be, um, with the strategy and what the kind of Katie, can you process turn, was developing. Can you turn it. around so that you're facing um, us? You just use your right or left arrow to turn all the way around. There you go. And then now you can use the camera controls if you need to like orbit and look at the screen. And the camera controls button is just down there at the bottom. Uh, okay, so our goal was develop a, to develop a digital strategy campaign that would bring global awareness um, to the effects uh, of the oil contamination that the uh, Atua people were living with. Um, but specifically, we really wanted to kind of struck a, strike a chord of empathy um, and kind of, you know, with not only with their, the, you know, the scope of the problem, but also with their added obstacle of being off the grid, so to speak, and not being able to really share uh, their problems with the outside world or have the access to do that. So uh, keeping that in mind, uh, our first couple questions were just to sort of you know, figure out who the target audience was and, um, and, and whether or not, you know, we were actually going to have to implement the strategy. We were going to develop, uh, the social media channels that they didn't already exist. Um, so we knew that they had an active Facebook. We knew they had an active Twitter. Uh, what we didn't know was that they actually did have an Instagram, uh, but it was something that they weren't really using at this point. Um, so, at the time, you know, we were wondering, kind of deciding how are we going to kind of come up with a multi-platform strategy and what platforms did we even have to work with? Um, so ultimately, our initial research, what we did was we just kind of looked at a variety of articles and websites uh, focusing on digital strategy and campaigns for nonprofits. We found several sources uh, about effective nonprofit digital campaigns. Uh, we met to talk about them. We looked at some campaigns in particular that we liked um, and things like that. And then once we had that 
Google Hangout with uh, Digital Democracy, we really realized Emily spoke a lot about uh, the Greenpeace Mobile Lab and also Amazon Watch's viral photos um, that got posted to Facebook and then people would pick those up. So keeping that in mind, um, you know, that was something that we started thinking about as well as this idea of, of, of sharing photos and sharing experiences as well. Um, so when we were coming up with the digital strategy, as we said, you know, we wanted it to have several, several prongs. We wanted it to incorporate Facebook and Twitter and the Instagram that they did have and were looking to build. So, um, with these, we kind of went, you know, went back, um, and, and came uh, up each of us with a couple of ideas. And interestingly, we all kind of came to this idea of going without or living without and somehow you know, developing that into some sort of strategy. Um, so ultimately we decided on the hashtag living without, um, and we kind of, we brought that idea to, to Emily as well. And the idea that we were kind of thinking about is these acts where people, since the oil contamination, you know, they're living without so much, not only are they living without access in a lot of cases, but they're living without the use of their land and some issues and, and loss of crops, lack of fresh water. Um, so we liked, you know, we liked this idea of, of kind of driving it home in a personal sense um, and, and challenging uh, social media users to live without something that they consider very near and dear to them. Um, so that was kind of where this idea came from. We, we, we had reason to believe that a lot of people, when we you know, when we pose this live without challenge are going to choose some sort of technology related um, item that they're going to go without because that's something that's, you know, just so much a part of our daily life. Um, so that being said, we then kind of thought, you know, why don't we see if we can have some sort of viral aspect in the way that the marriage equality campaigns had those equal signs that became um, so emblematic in people's Facebook display pictures and, you know, Twitter display images and things like that. So we went back to Emily uh, and kind of spoke with her a little bit about coming up with if whether or not there was some sort of meaningful image or icon or color uh, for the Astro people that we could incorporate into this icon that we would design. Um, ultimately, what we decided on, and I think, okay. Okay, so as you can see, the image that we ultimately uh, decided on is this wireless internet symbol um, with the X through it, um, which was something uh, to represent living without, and in the case of the actual people, to represent living without access in their case as well. Um, so in that case, you know, there was hope that this could be used in in further campaigns as well, because it could be something that it's so simplistic, but it's, you know, it has a very strong, strong message and it's something that could be used across a variety of campaigns if they wanted to use it again. So we were envisioning that the people who were using it in this instance would, you know, give up something, whether it was technology, technology related or not, um, for a specific period of time. We assumed that it would only be, you know, 48 hours to a week. We're not thinking people would really give something up for a super long period of time. Um, and then what we would challenge them to do is after the fact, or if it wasn't technology related, blog about their experience, tweet about their experience, Facebook update about their experience, um, about going without. Uh, so then our next step was to come up with mock-ups. And so I know Kelly is going to kind of just like walk through um, what, how we're going to use it on each platform and, and kind of what we're envisioning people, uh, people doing with it. This now. Katie? Yeah. All right, let's see. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I can see what I'm doing, too. <laughs> okay. So 
Katie mentioned, and can everyone hear me right now? Just making sure now that I can't say anything. You're good. Okay, good. Um, as Katie mentioned, we used this specific imagery um, so that it would be broad enough for digital democracy to use um, during different campaigns. When I met with Emily um, in person, she was very excited about that specific aspect of this campaign. Um, so when we're using this this uh, this image for Facebook, very similar to the equal sign for the Emerge Equality um, campaign, we would insert that um, as your display image, and that would indicate to your friends and your family and your followers that you are going to be living without something that week. Um, because we're focusing this campaign right now on the aspect of living without um, your cellular phone or cellular connection for that matter, um, we chose that specific image, but really that um, cross out bar could be put around anything. It's, it's simple enough to, to manipulate and make your own, um, much again like the equal sign. So once that is placed into your Facebook uh, uh, personal uh, image, your, your Facebook profile photo, um, you would have to indicate the hashtag live without and explain to your, um, your friends and family through your wall what you'd be living without that week or whatever period of time that you'd want to um, give it up. And I believe we have examples in the next image. Oh, is this out of order? Okay, this might be a little bit of out of order. This is our Twitter um, examples, actually. Um, now that I think about it, backwards is the, okay, sorry, I'm a little bit off. So this is the example that we had for the Facebook page. Um, as you can see, I changed my Facebook image to the, um, to the symbol. And I wrote that we were, I was living without, or I asked my, my followers what they could live without for that week and to show their support by changing their uh, profile picture as well and documenting what they live without for a week. I also linked digital democracy into that, um, into that post so that people would know that I was doing it uh, in conjunction with that uh, organization. So again, this is our example for Twitter. Um, for Twitter, I just did a very simple post, hashtagging the Live Without campaign. Um, this is a mock-up that I would be living without uh, my cell phone for no, going on the third day. Um, as you can see in the background, Katie also uh, changed her profile photo as well. So Twitter, we really just want um, the live without hashtag to be noted. We want digital democracy to be um, mentioned, so using their Twitter feed as well. Um, that way we can really document um, the momentum of this campaign by how many mentions and how many hashtags we have in the long term. Um, and once you would return to the, to the uh, I guess, digital world, the online world, um, you can, if you choose something non technical technology related, you want to indicate how that experience went through Twitter, Facebook, or a vlog or blog post. I open something else up by mistake. So finally, Instagram, and this is something that Emily really wanted us to um, to give her some some ideas on how to better use or utilize that uh, that Instagram page, which really had a few photos at best. Um, putting your symbol as the live without and uh, tweet or having it follow their Instagram page, and then also documenting your experience would be the best way we feel possible to to utilize Instagram in this campaign. So as I mentioned, uh, we really want to be able to know how this uh, campaign was successful in the long term. We noted a few options that were available for her um, for digital democracy in order to, um, to really understand if this was a success successful campaign. Um, the easiest one would be Google Analytics to see if there really are an increase in followers in, in, um, in visitors to the digital democracy website. But they you can also use um, uh, uh, Radian 6 we found, and that's actually a screenshot of a Radian 6 analysis, which is kind of difficult to see from this, um, from this slide. But Radian 6 has the ability to not only measure mentions across Twitter, but also 
blog posts, um, and measure individuals who are posting images and videos related to the campaign. Um, on Facebook, for instance, they have their own analytics system if they have their own group. So they'd be able to see an increase um, where and, and how uh, and when those increases happened. And then again, digital, uh, Google Analytics would be able to really give them an overall um, idea of how, how many people were really brought to digital democracy through that campaign. I believe we have a video um, of Monisha, she wasn't able to make it for this. A YouTube Yeah, let me grab the URL here for Okay, great. So again, this might take a minute to load, but you should see it um, shortly. It's loading for me now. Is it loading for people? I'll put the URL in the chat box just in case. Fortunately, I couldn't be there for the final presentation. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how our digital strategy campaign will be sustainable for the future. The I campaign will only take place for a month. People who want to get involved don't have to live without like something that they feel is a necessity for an entire month, unless they want to. People can choose how long they want to participate so they can start at any time and stop at any time. But digital democracy will be publicizing in a campaign for a month long. The campaign is a great way to get people involved, but what we feel is most important is that they walk away from the campaign with more knowledge. Start at any time and stop at any time. But, but digital democracy will be publicizing and campaigning for a month long. The campaign is a great way to get people involved. I can't hear it anymore. But what we feel is most important. The campaign. Digital. They walk away from the campaign with more knowledge about the issue than they had before. A lot of people on social networks repost images because they see it as trendy, they want to look involved, or someone told them to, but they don't really know too much about the issue. Every day of the campaign, Digital Democracy can post to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any other social network one fact or photo about the Ashuar people. They can utilize the live without hashtag so that people can click on what they post and learn what the campaign's really all about. So by the end of the campaign, the people will have seen something important about the Peruvian people's plight at least 30 times. The campaign itself isn't very sustainable over a long period of time, but the goal is to use the campaign to raise a sustained interest in the struggles of the Ashuar people. If a vast amount of people participate, it will only cause others to become curious about what it is and encourage them to seek more info about the issue. Raising awareness using social networks is the main goal of, camp of the campaign, but digital democracy can use this camp campaign in the future to raise funding as well. In collaboration with public labs, digital democracy plans to launch a Kickstarter to fund the development of open source, low cost hardware to be utilized by the monitors in Peru. So hopefully the more aware people become about this issue during and after the campaign, the more compassionate they will be for the Ashuar people. So that means the more they'll want to donate. Many of them may give up technology related items and this may help them to recognize what is like for the Ashuar to not even have access to technology, preventing them from really spreading the word and sharing with others what they're going to Was through. everyone able to hear that? The funds from the Kickstarter will go directly towards the equipment I was. they need. Similar yeah, successful too. campaigns yeah. have been some reason, by I, public labs. In the I was past. not able to hear that at all. Okay, so, so just future, just to make sure that the, um, the democracy the Kickstarter campaign was live without was understood by everyone. Campaign in anticipation and promotion. It's of still playing for me. Kickstarter. Okay, now it just finished.
Okay, so I put the um, URL there in the chat box. Um, so you just have to click on it from the chat box if you want to grab it and have to look at it. But um, did you did you want to follow up on that? Well, I guess if anyone just has any questions about it in the yeah. Q and A part, we can answer anything if it wasn't clear on the video or if you couldn't hear the video. Okay, questions. Um, this is really great, guys. Um, I was just curious. I love the image that you decided on. Um, how many images did you design before you decided on the one that you chose? We had a few. Um, actually, we will post a few of those uh, in the final post on Lore. Um, I think one of the initial emails that I sent out to the group with, I think, four or five examples, they were all around the same um, idea of, of with the cross in between. Initially, when I when we thought about uh, this idea, I was thinking about um, it specifically being related to the water contamination issue, um, and so incorporating some type of, of water imagery, like a water drop or or something like that. But then after speaking with uh, Emily at the um, at the uh, in person meeting, she was really keen on the idea of utilizing this campaign for other um, for other campaigns that that dealt with remote access, that dealt with people who were not able to access um, basic needs um, and also document those need, those issues that, to an extent that it would help them in the long term. Um, so just making it a simple cross in the end was, or cross out in the end was, was the key, I think. Yeah, I have to echo, I have to echo everybody's response. I think that, you know, the whole campaign is just great. Like it's really, I love the hashtag. Um, the simplicity of the concept, the way that it's integrated across the different platforms and sort of the idea of living without in the same way that the HUR people are living without. Um, you know, sort of tying it back to the fact that they're living without, you know, clean water and living without, you know, a lot of, a lot of different kinds of access and living without certain types of food. And I just really feel like that's, sort of a very powerful aspect to build the campaign around. And I think that, you know, it's just um, very touching, you know, so I think, I feel like people will really um, be able to identify with that, even if it's just, you know, going without their favorite food or whatever for three days, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that was really great. Right. I think it's just like a, a, like a brilliant campaign across the different platforms, you guys, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so um, one more question about it. Um, so within the different conversations that you've had with Emily and Gregor, um, do they already know about the campaign in its sort of fully fleshed form? Or is this something that you've kind of like been updating her on sort of in stages and in different processes or, or like what, um, how is that going? Um, I presented the initial idea to her in the one-on-one -on -one meeting, and that's been the last contact that I've had since then. She hasn't seen the, the actual imagery. Um, part of the meeting was to discuss with her whether or not there was any specific um, image or color scheme or something along those lines that she wanted us to integrate, and she really just wanted us to go free range with it. Um, so no, she hasn't really seen the final presentation of it at all. Okay. Great. I think that she's going to be really happy and surprised and pleased by um, both of you guys' um, projects, the microsite and the strategy. So um, I'm excited to um, show her the video. And also, um, just as a side note before I forget, um, can you guys send me your the actual PowerPoints behind these images and I'll forward them to her as well? Okay. Yeah, sure. Alrighty, so that was a note for everybody, by the way. Just send me the PowerPoints and I'll send them off to Emily. And um, okay, so I know we're kind of running a little bit behind, so let's go ahead and have the land rights and usage people talk, unless the um, unless the oil contamination people want to go first. It's, it's up to you guys. Ours doesn't have a PowerPoint. It's just the final website and then the websites leading up to that. So 
it's it's really up to you. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I can go. I, I mean, you're already yeah. standing up. All right. That's <laughs> true. Okay. Okay. So, am I turned around enough? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, same sort of thing. I'm just going to give a little bit of background information about um, our educational module and our ideas um, kind of leading up to it and how it kind of came to be. So, initially, um, what the question was, was we really were wondering about who our target audience was going to be. Um, that was a number, one of our first questions that we had when we were kind of developing uh, developing this idea. Um, and when we realized that it wasn't really for children, that they kind of wanted to target um, adults and activists with this, that kind of shaped uh, ultimately what we developed. Um, we wanted to provide a one-time learning opportunity module with the opportunity with the option that it could be built upon to be a multi-use uh, learning tool. But at this point in time, specifically, we wanted to provide a one-time learning opportunity, um, and then also something that they could build a donor campaign around. Um, should hold on, I'm gonna try to change the slide. Um, and also, yeah, like we used to build a donor or volunteer campaign around these issues. Um, so before we started, uh, what we did was we kind of started looking at various uh, educational modules on a variety of websites. Um, and what we kept finding when we were looking uh, was that so many were focused on children or even high school students, but there wasn't really anything that we were really finding that was, you know, conducive for adult learning. Um, it seemed very simplistic, uh, very much like read a paragraph, take a quiz on it. Eventually, what we found was the California Distance Learning Project, um, which taught through videos, which we found to be really interesting. Um, so it would be a learning learning through a video with subsequent activities to then test your knowledge. And we really liked this idea um, of incorporating video content. And we were really impressed with the sort of choose your own adventure type of learning. So that's where the inspiration for our educational module came from. Um, very much about about the choosing your own adventure. Wait, I think it went to the end. So yeah, so as I was saying, these are the sites that we sort of drew inspiration from, this idea of video learning, this idea of choosing your own adventure. Um, so then, as we were developing the idea, what we did is we kind of went into flowchart mode um, to kind of come up with the different questions that we could pose and ultimately what the answers could be and how that could be conducive to, to learning and, and the different paths that ultimately the user could experience. Um, we wanted it to be that they could change paths as the experience was happening. So if you go one way, it doesn't necessarily lock you into one particular route, but it would be able to, you'd be able to kind of move back and forth between the two paths. Um, ultimately though, once we got some feedback from both Josephine and Digital Democracy, once we had the Google Hangout, we didn't know necessarily that they had enough images and enough video that we could really sustain the flowchart as we had envisioned it here with being a little bit more complex. So it was kind of about, you know, paring it down a little bit for now at least to kind of work with what, um, what, uh, Digital Democracy had. Um, so we, we changed the flow chart a bit. And in this case, what we kind of were envisioning on the one side, it's experience a day in the life of the Peruvian Amazon president. And from there you would learn what they're doing to prevent further damage. Once you go through that, it would then allow you to move on to the other path. And the other path is take a tour of an oil, uh, of a site damaged by the oil spill. And then from there, learn how you can help to prevent further environmental damage. Um, so that was ultimately what we came up with for the flowchart uh, for what we were going to use, but we were still kind of stuck on what platform to use 
um, that had video functionality because that was something that was really important to us. Okay, so ultimately, um, we chose Buncee because it did have this, this video functionality that we were looking for. We were able to integrate Photoshop so that we could make it a little bit nicer. Buncee is quite a simplistic platform and ultimately, you know, background images could only be one color and things like that, but you could upload images um, and, and, and make them larger to be able to sort of develop something in Photoshop, make it look nicer, and then it had layers. So we were able to sort of have an image, you know, be linked to one particular Buncee uh, page and then have a video linked to another video and things like that. So there was the ability in Buncee to embed other pages from within it. So it gave it that choose your own adventure um, function that we were looking for. And another thing, because we did want this to ultimately potentially be used for a donor or funding campaign, what we liked about Buncee was that there was this ability for emailing it. It was an emailable platform. Um, so, so yeah, as you were saying, you know, we kind of brought this idea Emily, she liked it, um, and and then it was about developing the frames themselves. Uh, so Amy can kind of talk you through. This was what our final module ended up looking like, and she can sort of walk you through, um, walk you through that, and show you how the functionality would work. Okay, I'm gonna try and stand up now. <laughs> Did it? Okay. I forgot how to turn myself around. Just hit your right or your left arrow. And just like keep um, hitting the right or left arrow. Like on your keyboard, uh, hit the right arrow Sorry. all the way around. Just keep hitting the right arrow or the left arrow. Yeah, it'll turn you all the way around. Oh. And then use the um, and then use the camera controls too. Yeah. Camera controls. Oops. Okay. Cool. Hey. Um. So I'm going to skip ahead a slide or two. Um, these were some things we originally tried. Now, as you can see, the Photoshop helped us a lot. But this is what our final module looks like. And um, I will try, Josephine, is it possible to put our Choose Your Own Adventure Buncee link into the thing to see if it'll work to actually show it? Or should I just paste it in? Yeah, you can you can just paste it in. Um, I can I think I have which which Buncee do you want? Oh, the Choose Your Own Adventure. Okay, okay. all right. I I have it. Yeah, but I can do it. I just couldn't get it to work um, earlier, but I'll give it a try. Um, Okay. I'm going to put it in the Oops. chat also for you guys. Because I did know that the, okay, go ahead. Okay, so as, so as you can see, we have, it's a choose your own adventure. You can experience a day in the life of the Ashware people, or you can take a virtual tour of an oil spill. So let's say you want to take a virtual tour of an oil spill. You click on the link, which didn't work. It just keeps going back to, yeah, I don't know why it keeps going back to Ronnie's video. I mean, video. I don't know. For some reason, the Bunsies give it give it problems, but, but everything else seems to be fine. So, um, if you can just um, if everyone can just get the link okay. from the chat, um, I'll paste it again here, um, and then you can just open it yeah, externally. So I'll, I'll yeah, just just I'll talk kind of through, go through it. this in a, Yeah, I'll just talk through it. So you have a choice, and when you click on either of the um, options. I'll show you on the next slide. It starts to take you down a path. So this is your day in the life path on the um, um, on the left side, and on the right side you have your oil spill path. Um, so if you, I'm just turning this so I can see it. Um, if you go on the in in the day in the life or the oil spill, whichever one you do, there's a primary video that you can watch, and you click on that and you can watch the video. And then the idea is that there would be additional information on the side, which both summarizes the information in the video, but also gives you some additional information. And then when you're done with that, you can go to the bottom here, where there's another option to click on and 
another to another landing page, which in the case of Day in the Life brings you to what the Ashwar people are doing um, to prevent further damage. Again, here's another video, and when you're done with the video, there's another video you can watch, which actually takes you back to the oil spill, so you can watch the tour of the oil spill. So that that speaks to what Katie was talking about, that we didn't want you to be limited, that if you went you know, down one road, you could never get back to the other. And in addition, I mean, obviously you can, we hope that you'll continue on, but you could also drop out of the process at any point if you felt that your learning was satisfied. Um, for the oil spill, you take a tour of an oil spill. Likewise, there's information next to that where you can, um, where you actually learn about um, the oil spill, summarizing the information of the video and giving you some additional information. And then um, at the bottom, there's a, there's a link to another landing page which takes you to what you can do to help. There's a video that tells you what you can do to help. There's additional information as well as direct links to um, all of the social media pages of um, digital democracy. And then finally, um, there's a video at the end which takes you back to the front where you can have a chance to watch a day in the life um, of the Ashore people. If you guys, I, I know it's kind of not as cool when you talk about it like this uh, just because you don't actually get to see how the pages you know jump but if you look at it in your own browser as you move from page to page I think it really does feel a little bit like you are on an adventure like you're playing a game even though you're not being given like tasks exactly you're being given choice and so I think it it feels fun for people to you know click through decide what they want to do land on a new page with a new surprise there for what to do there's also you know in in it are, um, I guess it's um, four different videos, and if you go, whichever tour you go on, you get to watch um, three of them. Again, I, it won't play here because we're having trouble with the YouTubes, but the videos are very simple. They're video and text with music, but I think they're actually pretty emotionally compelling and do actually draw you in um, to the cause and what you can do to help because the images are powerful. And so are the um, and so are the facts and, and information. Well, um, let me let me um, let me pause right um, so here and um, why don't we put one of the YouTube videos in here because they they are actually working pretty okay. Um, so just so. Oh, because I don't think you can uh, see, I, I can the see video, them. Can you guys right? see them? I can't. I couldn't see it on Roni's video. Oh, right. No, I couldn't see hers either. So, <coughs> let me just paste it into the chat, the YouTube. Um, that's strange because I can see, I can see the tour of the oil spill thing now. Um, but go ahead and, and look at the YouTube just so you guys can get an idea of like what she's talking about. If you can't see it here in SL, go ahead and open the YouTube link um, externally. And just let us know like when you're done watching it.
everyone done watching the video? Yes. Cool. So um, that kind of gives you an idea. And um, that's that's the format that all the videos take, though. They, they give you different um, information. And um, so I'm going to now pass it on to Roni um, sent a video that kind of explains more about um, sustainability of our project and how it introduces um, change to digital democracy. Just as an introduction to that, um, this is something that can be emailed, that can be part of a bigger campaign, but we haven't developed the campaign that goes along with this in terms of, you know, mailing it out. Um, but this is, you know, a learning that can um, be given to people. And if a campaign's built around it, you can measure the success of it, but how, by how much people engage in it and then how they further act upon it. So I'll pass it over to Roni's um, video now. Josephine, I think you have the... Um, um, actually, okay. I don't have the link. I only have Roni's Digital Strategy YouTube. I don't have the other one. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just talk through the rest of it then. She did. She did. did she send it, it to you. That's weird. She sent it okay. to me. Um, I think she sent it to you. I, I, but maybe I not. Yeah, yeah, but, but, I, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not, I thought. I thought. Okay. Um, but I, I'm going to talk it talk through. Okay. All right. So, um, so, oh, it's echoing now. So, um, digital democracy, as far as we know, they haven't had a learning module like this before. before. That's what they told us. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, it's just echoing so much. I don't know how somebody's to mic, turn that off. Can somebody please turn off their speaker? Just make sure your speaker button's turned off. Um, so, digital democracy, um, like, it, we, we, we met with them, but we also looked at their current Get Involved link um, on their site. And it's kind of a little bit rudimentary because there isn't a lot of, of chance, you know, to um, to follow up. And we were trying to add more specificity to that and also to add more of an emotional connection to hook people in on the organization. Because one thing that, you know, sort of looking around the digital democracy site and that kind of thing, um, there's not as much of an emotional component, even though the second that you look at their images um, and hear about what they're doing, um, you can see that there that there definitely could be. Um, so, you know, if you were to email this to people as part of a campaign, you wouldn't just be reading an email. They wouldn't just be asking you for money. You'd actually be participating in something fun and emotionally engaging. And sort of like, as I mentioned, you're, you're kind of playing like a light version of a game. Um, you know, can this be sustainable? This module will be very effective for a donor or slash volunteer campaign. Digital democracy just basically needs to add the email um, to go along with it that would set the context and give people a next step. Um, and they can also test its effectiveness, you know, measuring um, the results of the campaign. And then if effective, they should consider building other modules. The cost of this is actually relatively minimal. I'm not saying if you hire a professional company to do it, but you could find like a student um, or even like a, a younger person and pay them as little as $1,200 to develop something like this. It's really quick and easy um, to put together. Um, if you have, what you need is you need the images and you need the information. That's what it takes a long time, you know, to pull together. And so you would need them to give some guidance, but they have the information and they have the, um, the images. They didn't have a lot of video in this case, so we put movement on images, but if they had video, um, so much the better. Um, there might be an additional cost for music comp composition, or you might have to use um, Creative Commons. Um, because you know there might be a clearability issue in terms of the music but it really can be done especially if this this campaign is effective i mean the campaign could even potentially recruit volunteers who would be willing to build um these modules and especially considering that like the buncy that we built it sort of serves as an example of how you can do this um and i think that gives you a sense of how our module would work and unless katie you want to add anything else Uh, no, I think you pretty much covered it. I mean, unless anyone has any questions that they want to ask about it. Um, so I just have a, um, a couple of quick little questions for you guys. Um, firstly, like, congratulations to you guys, too. Like, I think that the, the modules look really good. I think they look very slick and simple. Um, you know, it's exactly what you want to 
to house inside um, whatever it was, like an email campaign or a microsite or things like that, just keeping it like really like, you know, simple stories um, that you can click through, get the videos and that kind of thing. I love the choose your adventure um, type of format um, and the way that you guys kind of um, filtered it down to, um, you know, like to, just to an essence, I guess. Um, did you look at how Buncee performs on a mobile platform on like other devices, like phones, things like that? I, we didn't actually really look into that. I don't know if Katie, if you thought about that, I didn't think about that. No, I didn't, I didn't think about that. So I looked at it a little bit and, um, it, it seems to, to be sort of okay on on well, on my iPhone anyway. I didn't try it like on, on another platform. Um, but uh, one thing that I did notice was that the in in the desktop version of it, that every time I went to go to another adventure, it would open a new page. So like it would open the new Buncee page of that other adventure. Is there a way because at the end of like going through, let's say, you know, a couple of different videos and it takes it back to the end, I'd have like four windows open. Is there any way of controlling whether it opens a new window or stays on the same page? Um, I, um, I think, oh. oh, I was, I personally didn't see an option to change the linking if it was going to be like opening in a new window or open it within the same window, but I don't know if Amy, if you did. Um, I actually did play around with it, and I can't remember exactly how, but there is a way to, um, I think it's in the settings in the Buncee. I think you can decide which way it's going um, to go. It's like, it's a setting issue, I believe, and probably it would be better if it was set so that it just opened directly um, to the the new, um, if it went to the landing page without opening a new um, window. But I believe you can just adjust it. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering about that. Um, because otherwise, I would say, like, I really like that Buncee platform, but I was like, why does it keep opening new pages? Oh, my gosh. Um, so, so yeah, um, but it seems like it's, like, a relatively easy platform to work within. Would it be easy? Do you think it would be easy for, like, somebody at DD to sort of configure and, like, take on and, you know, go forward with? Absolutely. I think it's very user-friendly, and it's very what you see is what you get. And it's if anything, it, it's overly simplistic like I think sometimes that's kind of the issue is you just have to you know upload the the Photoshop images and things like that to make it a little bit more sophisticated looking but as far as the functioning of adding links and things like that it's very simple to use that's good I mean I think that's always a trade-off like if you know like Great. simple simplicity versus too much simplicity and functionality then you don't have enough functionality so um, but it sounds like you know this is something that would kind of be a really good option if they wanted to say like give it to an intern to do or something like that I think that platform makes it really sustainable. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I said I think the platform makes it actually really sustainable because anyone could use it. Like any college student, with even if you didn't have a lot of sophistication in design, computer programming, any of those things, you could put this together really simply and easily, which I think makes it likely that digital democracy might continue Great. to use it. Um, I also wanted to say that I thought the videos looked really good. Um, I know you guys were working with just basically still images, but sort of the verbiage that you put together with the still images, I think, were really powerful. Um, and especially, I feel like the, the oil spill tour, where you're showing sort of like the oil on the hands and the oil sludge in the water and things like that, like along with just the simple verbiage that you put in there are really impactful. Yeah. Did you, did all, did everyone get to see the oil spill tour video? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so um, I'll follow up too with putting everyone's um, sort of relevant URLs and things like that into like a final pose so everyone can see each other's work and have that. Um, all right, great. Does anybody else have any questions? Great job, guys. Yeah, very good. Great, cool. All right, Thanks. so congratulations to you guys. And I know we're about five minutes, six minutes um, past time. Um, do you guys, can you stay like about um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes longer to see the uh, last group?
Make it quick, we promise. <laughs> sure. All right, great, guys. Go ahead and launch into it whenever you're ready. So our education module was uh, to um, bring awareness of the oil contamination in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, I think we had an initial question across the board, each group of us, what our, uh, our audience was, and that was definitely a concern for us um, from the start. Uh, once we were able to talk to Emily in, in the initial hangout, um, we decided to make it a quick and simple um, educational tools. So our, our first step was really just to come up with uh, basic research and we did a few models first. We, we did Google documents, we sent each other emails, um, but I think what we really found to be useful was the Padlet um, website and you can see some of our initial research. Oh, I didn't need to turn around, sorry. Uh, here. I don't know if any of you used this at all as well, but um, we were able to post YouTube links, and it wasn't just um, Peru-based. There were there were a few links on here that are just about oil contamination, what the effects can be on an ecosystem, but also on on humans as well. Uh, after that, we decided that we wanted to do a quiz, and we found a very good example, which I will place that next. This was kind of our inspiration. It was just a simple aerospace educational module quiz um, used on the site. More or less fill in the blank. We wanted something a little bit more interactive because we felt that what was really missing from the initial uh, digital democracy website was an interaction um, aspect for the audience and the audience that we felt that they were trying to um, trying to gain trying to gain empathy from in general uh, really would would benefit from the interaction. So we used Quizlet and I believe that Aaron is going to talk about our next steps to create our Quizlet site. Yes. Um, I, I uh, wanted to put up the Quizlet template too on the on the left side is that okay yeah, sure, go for it. okay so I hopefully I can just copy and paste it in here okay so can everyone see that the quizlet page coming up slowly there we go Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so we decided to go with Quizlet, one, because it was simple to use, and two, um, you can, you're creating these great flashcards and you're able to um, upload photos. We, we chose the free site, so we used um, uh, the photos that were available on their website. A lot of them are on Flickr, um, but if you pay for a premium, um, membership, you can upload your own photos. So we thought that this would actually be great for a digital democracy to use since they have so many um, great images. Um, so what we did is we, we kind of categorized um, the information uh, into uh, three, three main categories and then each of us wrote um, five questions. I'm sorry, did someone, was that just someone's mic? Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, okay. Um, so, okay, so we, we wrote questions based on each category. So, um, so one person uh, just did, if you can see here, some general information on um, Peru and the Amazon, its water, um, things like that. And then um, 
another one focused on the Ashuar people and the oil spills. So then we're getting a little bit more information on, on that group. Um, and then the third category was um, the type of technology that people um, have in Peru in the urban areas. And then to contrast, the, the type of technology that people have in the rural areas. So I don't know if you can see here. Um, so it said, one question says, what percentage of people have internet access in urban areas of Peru? And it's 37%. Um, and and uh, I'm looking for the internet access. Okay, and then it's only 2.3% percent of rural areas have computers and 0.3 percent have internet access in rural areas of Peru. So um, so we wanted to, uh, you know, we wanted to give some information to show that and it actually would go really well with the uh, with the live without hashtag campaign, just a little side note, because that might be a good, um, like a shocking thing for people to know. Um, okay. And then I wanted to also show you what the flashcards look like on, um, so this is just kind of the, the template that we can still work in. And then I wanted to show you what it looks like. The great, the other great thing about Quizlet is you can embed the flashcards into your own website. And it looks something like this. Maybe. Uh. Still on the Quizlet. All right, here's the other link. I'm posting it. Oh, you okay. Oh, here it comes. Can everyone see this? Okay, well, we created another um, little microsite just so that we could demo um, demo the flashcards. And if Digital Democracy chose to, they could also link this to their web page. Um, so the great thing about flashcards in general is um, research that shows that people who are doing flashcards are um, are engaging in active learning. Um, one and two, um, they're they they're learning quicker because they're one making a prediction on what they think the answer is going to be. So they're already actively thinking about the answer, and then if they're correct in their answer, they think about. Um, why they were correct and so it reinforces the correct answer and then also usually makes them think of it in another way and two if they're incorrect they of course assess why they were not correct and they're most likely to remember the correct answer so we thought it would be a great interactive way for people to learn quickly about Peru and the Amazon um, so what's let's see so, and um, the other good thing about Quizlet is you can do both sides, or you can also do your standard question and answer um, that we're used to doing when they're, you know, physical flashcards. So, um, we just thought it would be good if, if it's a younger person, they could just read it and get the answer, or if someone wanted to quiz themselves, then they could do it that way as well. And, um, and then I think Kelly's going to talk again about the um, sustainability. We'll get uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just realized I wasn't standing up. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. No worries. Um, um, so really, the sustainability uh, depends on on how um, involved in digital democracy will be in the future. In order for it to be sustainable. New flashcards and photos really do need to be integrated and created uh, quite often um, to keep it updated, to keep it fresh, to keep people engaged in that matter. Um, there could be a way for 
uh, followers to be involved um, submitting questions. I know that if you get an answer incorrect or if you believe that your answer was correct on a Quizlet, you can actually insert um, what you believe or, or um, challenge it really. So that might be a way for there to be more interaction involved um, between the two two and um, populations here, the, the activists, the potential activists, and uh, digital democracy themselves. So really these flashcards could be integrated with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, like we said before. Um, and uh, if utilized well, I, I do believe that they will be sustainable. Now, um, we were thinking that this would be a pretty simple way um, to to continue if there was even an intern or something that wanted to take this over. Um, again, when we met with um, with Emily in person, we knew that it was something that she would not be able to sustain herself. So um, we purposely designed something that we thought someone else could pick up pretty easily. Perfect, you guys. So congratulations on that too. I really like how um, how straightforward um, the flashcards are. Like the fact that you know, um, I just yeah, flashcards are, are great for for sort of continuous and active learning, as you pointed out before. It's like the whole idea of kind of guessing and the interactivity of it, um, the fact that they're embeddable, that kind of a thing, and the fact that they're like really easy to design. Uh, the site makes it really easy and. Um, going forward, you know, any intern could you know, take the curriculum and you know, turn it into flashcards, ideally. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Okay, so um, one thing that I thought about too, and just wrapping things up here, is um, I think that you guys mentioned that going forward, if um, someone were to take it over and say like an intern or someone um, were to, to make more flashcards out of it, that you would want to add some sort of element of uh, like a challenge or something like that. Can you talk a little bit more towards the idea of kind of challenging the answers? Um, yeah, I just, I had noticed um, while playing around with with this myself, uh, that there's, you can change the format, like, uh, like Aaron mentioned, you can do flashcards front and back, but you can also do a type in the answer. Um, and it will, it will give you, even if you are off by like a letter or by a number, it'll tell you it's incorrect, but it will tell you what you have got correct within that, that answer, um, as a way to learn. And it had a little note at the bottom stating, um, do you believe that this is incorrect? And you could click on that and actually challenge or, or indicate what you thought the correct answer was. Um, so I thought maybe that would be something that they could use potentially in the future. Um, I'm, I, I mean, there could be other ways of, of integrating a challenge, um, maybe in terms of the flashcards in a game of how many, how many questions you get correct and um, have like a top tier of, of individuals that are, are doing these, these question and answers. Yeah, I like that idea too, like the idea of kind of feeling some sort of participatory link back to it. And I maybe even feel like, and this is sort of dependent on the platform too, I love the idea of maybe suggesting flashcards, you know, so if people had an idea for their own flashcards that they'd be able to maybe add them and and again, that's like that may totally not be you know doable on this platform, but just something kind of going forward that you know might be available on a future platform. Who knows? All right. Okay. Great. So, um, so yay! Congratulations to everybody. So give yourselves a round of applause. I think if you just put slash clap into the chat, you'll have your hands. Your hands will clap. <laughs> And one thing that I wanted to do um, is take a picture of everybody in front of the marquee. Okay, so let's head out to where the marquee is and take a group photo. <laughs> 